uh hello again it's it's yes it's it's me again i haven't gone away no one's um managed to assassinate me yet i'm sure they're trying and more silver where is the silver i'll, I'll bring it on exit from entrance from stage right um we saw teaspoons last time and i love spoons and they're, they're, they're one of my passions. But silver can also be extremely tactile when you make large objects out of it, expensive large objects. And there are very few things, um, having handled all manner of silver over the years, there are very few things more tactile than a source boat. Normally, they come in pairs. Uh, when they do, and they're Georgian and they're silver, they're very expensive. So, um, you know, paupers like myself often have to content ourselves with a single source boat. This is um, the, f the first thing I want to clear up, and this is all Bisto's fault. Bisto gravy granules. We all saw the adverts when we were children of the family lovingly pouring their Bisto out of their gravy boat. Um, that's not how they were used in the 18th century. That's not how they were meant to be used in the 18th century. Um, it's how we use them now because we're all greedy buggers and we like lots of gravy and we do this business. And we get drips everywhere, but that, that's not how you use them. These would always be accompanied by a pair of small ladles. And the ladle would go in the bowl and the handle of the ladle would rest on the lip and you pass it somewhere or you pick it up and you take the ladle out and you could all the drips from the ladle would go on the lip put the sauce or gravy because they're sauce boats really they're not gravy boats they're sauce boats you would put the sauce over your dish you would return the ladle and you would put it back on the table for somebody else to use um the sauce funnily enough um i, I was looking through the assay office registers of um, York Assay Office. And these are most frequently called butter boats at the beginning of the 19th century. Not gravy boats, ne never gravy boats um, in, in period descriptions. Sometimes and, and most often sauce boats, but butter boats. And that is because the prevalent sauce at the time that was used for these wasn't your Sunday roast gravy, but it was actually a sort of form of hollandaise. So um, it's a you know, that creamy hollandaise over a nice cold salad or some boiled vegetables. That was the order of the day when this was made. Now, when was this made? I must I must be clear because I keep assuming you will know these things. This is a beautiful hand raised sauce boat from. Let's have a look at the date letter. It's a Gothic key, so it's 1760. And it was made by, and I must mention who the maker is, it was made by Daniel Smith and Robert Sharp. Now, in all my years of uh, dealing and cataloguing and valuing silver, um, you get to see a lot of work by various partnerships and people, and everybody will know Paul Delamry and they'll know Paul Storr. Uh, they may not know Smith & Sharp. I've never seen a bad piece of silver made by Robert Sharp and Daniel Smith. They were both apprenticed to the same person, Thomas Gladwin, who himself was a very good uh, workman like London silversmith. But Smith & Sharp, uh, everything they made was good. It was never bad. Um, it was never cheap. It was never, there was never a question of it being even ugly. Everything they made may not be, you know, there aren't any, if this was Paul Delamry, that would be a grotesque lion mask. If it was by Robert Calderwood of Dublin, there'd probably be an eagle, cast eagle, screeching around the side of it. And if it was by one of the more exclusive, um, slightly earlier Huguenot makers, this might be a, a dolphin, a flying cast dolphin, or a lovely figural caryatid. So there's none of that, to be fair. But what you've got is a beautiful, hand-raised, 
You notice I, I'm not putting this down. Good, good silver. You never want to put down. It's too. It's got a lovely feel to it. It's like the surface of it is like silk, and it's extremely tactile. Um, they've cast the feet, but you know this scroll foot is more detailed than a normal scroll foot. There's a bit more going on here. This shell. This is a lot of silversmiths will cast this in one piece. This section has been cast and this shell to give it more relief, to give it more definition. That has been cast in a separate piece and soldered on. And that's all time and expense. The handle. Again, the handle is cast. They're always cast in two pieces. You will normally towards the base if you you breathe on a piece of silver and it takes the glare of the surface away and you can see the surface marks more clearly. That's why, you know, you know, we haven't all got asthma or some sort of breathing disorder if you go to a silver viewing and we go, <gasps> you know, it's not, it's not because we're wheezing or we're, we're about to collapse. Um, more's the pity, some of them don't. Um, it's so we can see marks and any defects as well. It's a very good thing to do to look for defects. But in this case, You'll see a seam running up. So that is cast in two separate sections and soldered together. Uh, and again, it's all about definition. There's, there's, you know, there's an extra curl here. There's an extra bit there. Uh, you know, Smith and Sharp did not stint when they made a piece of silver. Um, you'll often see source boats of this size with simply a waved cut rim or just a plain rim with some gudrooning. But you'll notice with this, if I get it, just goes up there, doesn't it? Just goes up there slightly. No need for that. Again, you just you could just have that sweeping along. But they've said, mm, no, it looks better if we if we just bring that section up and we'll have, you know, we'll put the moulding there and it just makes it move more. It just makes it a bit more splendid um probably not much more than the normal price but there's a care with their work and they work from you know i think 17 late 1750s but there's a missing register at goldsmith's all but late 1750s into the 1770s they're known to have supplied parker and wakelin because the parker and wakelin ledgers exist and really they didn't use anybody who wasn't of the very best standard and they also made the Doncaster race cups a lot of those and I did see a splendid cup many many years ago by Smith and Sharp absolutely beautiful in the latest Adam taste and that was supplied to Pickett and Thede who were sort of early competitors to Rundle bridge and rundle so it, it they they made things for the very best people um source boats are normally good source boats <sighs> he's breathing again proof of life um a marked on the base maker's mark standard mark telling you it's silver town mark telling you it's made in london and date letter telling you when it was made um sometimes they'll be marked here as well uh, and it changes slightly. Later ones tend to be marked here. Earlier ones tend to be marked here. There's no rhyme or reason to it. And, and often it's done to accommodate either engraving or decoration. Because sometimes you will have the crest or family arms on there. Uh, this one does have, not that I've traced it, a beautiful... You can't probably can't see that. I'll put, I'll put more pictures on. And if we do that, you can see it now. Um, does have a beautiful engraved coat of arms. And not just the coat of arms, but it's got all the mantling. And it's got the crest of a, an ostrich holding a horseshoe with its wings displayed. So it's top stuff. And even, you can tell, this was 1760, so we were still at the end of... Chippendale's fashion for chinoiserie decoration. We're just getting into it. And we've got 
uh, and I will take a photograph of this because you will never see it, but in the foliage of the mantling around the armorial, we've got little Chinese figures perched in as well. So it's all it's all bells and whistles. Um, and, you know, if there's one area of collecting um, silver that probably isn't as sought after as it used to be, it's English domestic silver, which is which is crazy. I've seen coffee pots go down in value. I've seen salves go down in value. Uh, you know, source boats. A pair of these, 20 years ago, and there would have been a bun fight for them. Even a single one would have happily made, you know, 15, 1800 pounds. But these days, I'm afraid, um, everybody wants their sauce out of a packet or a pan on the cooker. Nobody wants it in a sauce boat, but these are these are fantastic things. And if you're looking to collect pieces, antique pieces of Georgian silver, again, you know, this is pristine um, and it's getting on for 265 years old. That's that's old enough, isn't it? And something that's tactile, something that you can take out of a cabinet and, and enjoy and marvel at the craftsmanship. And again, like the spoons I showed you in the last video, all of this is hand raised from a large lump of silver. You know, there's some poor guy sat there hammering away hour after hour, building up row after row after row of hammer marks, making sure the silver was even throughout and came up to a certain thickness and shape. And if you try to do that yourself, you, uh, you go insane. You know, one bit would be higher than the other, one bit would be deeper than the other. This is years and years of skill. Um, beautiful thing. If you're interested, if you offer me enough money, because I quite like it, I might send it to you. Um, but if nobody wants to buy it, that's not a problem either. Um, glad to be able to show this to you. And uh, tune in next week for more bits of shiny old nonsense. <laughs>